don't even act like that isn't cool. <laughs> Welcome to episode number 33. How you doing, Sylvia? I am doing fantastic. Wow, that opener, that was that was a heck of a day on the set, wasn't it, guys? I mean, that was that was pretty grueling stuff, but it all worked out in the end, and uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Jordan, talk to us. All right. Well, let's see here. It's actually a nice change of pace. I am in Secaucus, New Jersey, brought to yeah. you by Holiday Inn Suites. Nice. Fine, fine ho hoteler. You get paid to say that. <laughs> Chris, how are you? Great. I'm coming from uh, your old stomping grounds in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, just chilling in my office. Thanks for having me on. Sure. So welcome, Chris. Um, Secaucus. That sounds totally made up. <laughs> You're probably <laughs> yeah. Dayton somewhere. Uh, today is brought to you by the Homewood Suite Hotels in West Valley City, Utah, which is right outside of Salt Lake, which means tonight mm -hmm. is not brought to you by beer, but is brought to you by Smart Water. Yum. Smart water. It makes you. It, it's just it's tasty, tasty, oh. tasty. And speaking of tasty, Jordan, you know what I really want are some of those tasty challenges. The Cell TV Challenge. Over to you, Jordan. Wow. That was, uh, that was, um, that was a lot of money. We put our, our whole our whole uh, production budget for that. Yeah. So I hope you like it. Actually, um, so last week I asked you what is the longest VBA command you can think up. We had some really interesting responses, and I thought, hey, why not continue it for another another uh, round? So we are going to continue this for another round. And remember that um, that what is up is your very own version of the new Mr. Excel uh, 40th book by Bill Jelen and our very own Sylvia Juhas and also an e-book copy for some of the more interesting uh, suggestions, an e-book copy of my book, Advanced Excel Essentials in PDF form. Now, if you think you know the answer, if you think you have a good answer, a smart answer, a funny answer, you can always go to excel.tv, tweet us um, at excel.tv, or go to our Facebook group, and Facebook page, and of course, you can always just, you know, rent a biplane and write it into the sky, or do some other thing you expect people to. But whatever you do, make sure to let us know, because we would like to know, and we we've got some interesting ones in, and we're hoping to get a few more. So uh, that is our challenge, and we're continuing, continuing, and extending it another episode. Well, wonderful. So, uh, so thank you for that, Skywriting. However, you can get the message to us, we, we certainly do appreciate right. that. Excel TV, we're all over the place. We do have access to the sky, so you know, we'll we'll check the messages <laughs> there too. Uh, so, next up, our very special guest, Mr. Chris Newman, Mr. Chris Macro, Mr. The Spreadsheet Guru. Chris, first off, I got to ask you, Chris Macro, where did that come from? That was uh, actually a nickname that um, one of my managers gave me because uh, I was doing all this crazy macro stuff. And when I was building my website, I was like, oh, that, that'd be kind of a cool little nickname that would differentiate myself and make me stick out and uh, kind of went with it. The first, the first time that I mentioned you on the show, it was... Um, yeah, it must have been like episode number two or three, and, and I think you had just released something. I said, okay, well, everybody go check out uh, Chris Macro. And I remember mentioning to, to Jordan at the time, I said, hey, it, this on the show, actually, I said, this sounds like a made-up name. It's probably really Joey Macro or Andrew Macro or something like that. But Chris Macro, that just, that just doesn't sound right. So Yeah, it's going to be true. <laughs> uh, also, uh, recall that uh, Mr. Jordan Goldmeyer, his his, his 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 claim to fame is living close to you. Is, is there any truth in that, or or is that all just fiction? Uh, that is true. We actually had a uh, dinner one night together and talked about Magic it. Magical evening. Wow. It was very romantic. A little bromance. <laughs> I like it. The show's about to get interesting. <laughs> Can I? I just want to point something out real quick that uh, um, 
Rick did think it was made up in the same way that he thinks Secaucus, New Jersey is made up. So my <laughs> reputation is... It's all bogus, man. It's all bogus. It's all, Chris, you know, this is a very popular names. question. Uh, a lot of people ask you that, the Chris Macro thing. I, I do want to hear more about that transition, and I would like to pitch it to Bravo while we're at it, if you don't mind. <laughs> Jordan, you were saying something clever when I interrupted you. Oh, no, it wasn't that clever. But yes, <laughs> tell us more about... Um, Tell us more about, you know, how you became known around the office and, you know, because a lot of people, I think a lot of people sort of get their start that way. Um, you know, how did you, how did you start dabbling in um, such that you got that nickname? Yeah, so when I first started in my career, I was in a rotation program and uh, I was kind of going through the rotation program um, and that was basically you would, you would be in a, position within the finance department uh, for six months and then rotate. So uh, I was talking with someone and he happened to be a director who had just lost an analyst, his only analyst. And somehow I made a good first impression and he said, I want you to fill my position while I uh, go hire someone. And he was looking for an engineer with a finance background. So it was very hard and specific to come by. Um, so I had two weeks with this uh, analyst early on in my career and she did all this crazy VBA stuff and all these crazy lookups and I was still kind of fresh uh, just getting a hang of the V lookups and what spreadsheets were um, and I, I had two weeks to learn all that she uh, did and I did not learn close to enough of what I needed to. So I was kind of left by myself um, in the group I was at. I was kind of supposed to be the the support person in Excel. So um, I was kind of left on my own to kind of figure out how all her crazy macros worked. And um, first thing I did was go to Google, and I happened to find this uh, forum called MrExcel.com. Um, so I hopped on that. And I typed in a question, and two minutes later, I had an answer. And I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. Um, Probably so, Zach Parisi up there uh, helping me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, little by little, I just kind of worked my way through and kind of taught myself VBA. And no one was really using VBA at the, at the time. And that, that was kind of like an outside, outside consultant would come in and write some VBA for someone to do a task and they didn't really have anyone in-house. Um, so as I as I left that role when they eventually filled it and went through the rotation, I was doing all this cool VBA stuff um, through each rotation. Um, and I kind of soon became known as the Excel expert for the whole company just, just because I kept learning and learning and getting on those forums and uh, hence the name Chris Macro. It's a very familiar story, isn't it? I mean, and it's, I'm sure you would agree, this is kind of somewhat unique to our industry, or, you know, if we call ourselves Excel experts, because, like, you couldn't do this if you were uh, in the medical field, right? <laughs> you couldn't be like, you know, okay, he was leaving in two weeks, and the patient had this ginormous tumor and you know there was all this code baked into the medical files and you know so I just started looking on WebMD and I figured I would and I had two weeks to figure it out and then I was there so it's very unique to our, um, <laughs> our field because they just hear this story again and again and in fact that little um, it was it was it was meant to be funny. I hope uh, that little bit. I, that's what I was thinking when I was listening to you on that podcast. I was like, could you imagine if it was like a surgeon or something? Be like, yeah, I didn't know anything about. Uh, I didn't even know what a scalpel was, but you know, I had, I had access to the internet. You're in the <laughs> deep water and you got to swim. So, but but that said, you know, not everybody uh, gets hooked on VBA. Like, like you obviously did um, in such a short amount of time. In fact, I see a lot of people who are like, yeah, VBA, and then the minute they realize what's involved, it's kind of like suddenly, you know, the, the energy suddenly changes and they sort of give up. So what was it for you, what is it about you, Chris, that you think made it so interesting or what, what do you love about it? Well, I, I think 
at first it wasn't interesting at all. <laughs> it was more of a more of a necessity. It was a rotation. <laughs> it was more of a necessity, and I, I still have the code because it was so long and crazy. Um, and if you know anything about VBA, you know that looping can save a lot of time and effort. And uh, this individual had not taught herself uh, how to loop. So I was just left with thousands and thousands of line of code. And um, I was just expected to update it at year end. Uh, so I kind of had, I think, four or five months to kind of figure out how to update this code. Um, right. So I, I kind of started from the beginning and tried to find some beginner kind of articles. And I, I was on the forums a lot. And mm -hmm. once I, once I kind of knew and and started to see what all I could do and how much time I could save, uh, I just got addicted to it. Um, so I, I just kept, it, it just seemed like every time I hopped on the forums, I was learning something new, and oh, I can shorten my code by 10 lines and do do it just with one line of code, and it's, it's crazy how much stuff you can really do with VBA. Right. So how do you... Um how do you kind of separate, because I know what you're saying about it being addicting, how do you kind of separate um, when it's time to not do everything in VBA, you know, versus just like writing a formula or something like that? Yeah, so I think, I think you go through stages. So I definitely went through a stage where I was just doing everything in VBA and uh, forgetting about formulas, because I, I just thought it was so cool and I liked clicking the button and just having it, having it go. Um, and then you kind of you kind of go back to the stage where you're working with people who don't really know VBA, and you're getting back into the formulas, and and it kind of clicks that oh maybe I could be doing this easier and faster by just doing formulas and not having to worry about updating VBA code all the time. So it's definitely it's definitely a talent to know how much VBA or or when to know, when to use VBA versus. Um, the spreadsheet formulas, and that's something that takes some time to master, and I'm I still mm -hmm. struggle with it every day. So, um, at what point did you did you um, think, hey, I should start writing a blog, and, and why? I mean, you know, so there's so many people who just become the office experts. Uh, what you know, what motivated you to transition into to uh, creating a blog? Yeah, so it was, it was kind of a progression. Um, so going back to when I was going through all those rotations and uh, doing all this crazy stuff no one had seen in Excel before, when I was leaving, the managers were kind of freaking out because they had to pass that work on to someone else. And if a change came up, uh, they were scared that they wouldn't know how to fix it. So kind of the solution we came up with was I started teaching advanced uh, Excel classes once a month to the whole finance department. Um, and then anyone who was kind of interested in that stuff could attend. And uh, through that, I kind of started making like these articles um, and lessons and sharing those. And I kind of came to an idea one day just to kind of post that on the web. Wouldn't it be great if I can just point my coworkers to a website? And uh, it kind of started off as that. And um, I, I would have coworkers come up to me and say, oh, I couldn't, how do you do something like this? And I would look at it and I was like, well, did you Google it? And they would say, yeah, but all it got me were forums. And I don't really like going through the forums because I get confused. So then I would start writing articles and posting it there, just specific stuff that was kind of just hard to find on Google. Um, so that's kind of how it snowballed, and it started taking off, and I started promoting it a little bit and started meeting really cool people in Excel like you guys, and uh, it's just kind of grown from there. I'm sorry, were you talking to us? I'm no, yes, no, 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 especially <laughs> guys. And speaking of those, of those, of those cool guys that are out there on the internet, you know, some of those, some of those Excel bloggers, many of them watch the show, and I have some questions for you, Mr. Chris Macro. So here we go. This comes from John Michelotis of my 
excelonline.com. He also uh, runs a, a podcast, so go check that out. You have to believe you were on the first episode of this podcast, so that's out there as well, so go check that out. And his question to you, Mr. Chris Macro, is, with the intro of Power BI Tools, that was very nice. The intro of Power BI Tools, do you think that there will be less or more reliance on custom Excel edits? Well, so custom Excel add-ins are just that, they're custom. So they're they're really particular to your business needs. I think all these tools that uh, Microsoft is putting out are definitely going to help people um, kind of get to that more visual aspect of uh, analysis. But behind the scenes, if you need something really specific to your your niche, um, you're gonna you're gonna need something like VBA or Excel formulas to do that for you. So I think I think they're definitely heading toward the right track. But I think there's always gonna be a place for VBA and and formulas uh, in the workplace. Uh, that, that, that was the correct answer. Fifteen points. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but here's a tough one. Here's a tough one from Kauser Ahmed of Exceldemy.com. So think of Udemy, Exceldemy. So I'm going to say that one. Exceldemy.com, so go check him out. Here is his question for you, Mr. Chris Macro. Some people approach to learn Excel VBA, but they have no prior knowledge of programming. What is the easiest way to teach them in VBA? Ooh. So that's kind of my situation. I had no computer programming background or anything like that. Um, I think definitely uh, taking a class would help um, or reading a book. Uh, I did that later on, and I, I wish I would have started out with that because it made a lot more sense. Um, and definitely getting on forums because I mean, there's so much knowledge out there, and there's so many smart people that are just willing to to share what they know, and they'll walk you through it, baby steps, and uh, it's a they're great resources out there for you to learn. Question, follow up on that briefly, <laughs> but would it have been? You said so. You read the book. You read a book, maybe like John Walkenbach or something. This is very similar to my VBA journey. Would it have been? Would it have made more sense to start with a book because? How could you be interested in that unless you've already played around with the macro recorder? Like, I, in fact, I talk about this in my book. Um, <laughs> no, no plugs there. Yeah, it, so like for me, I played around with the macro recorder for a long time, and I sort of realized, you know, that that was not going to be a long-term thing, and I had to at some point read a book. But I wouldn't have been able to stick with it if I hadn't already been. My interest wasn't piqued by playing around with the macro recorder. So I'm just curious if you yeah. want to. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a valid point. Um, I, I liked having just a book where I could look up uh, in the index of the back of the book right. and kind of have a one, one shop stop to mm -hmm. get an answer right away instead of right. uh, going all through Google. But mm -hmm. it, I mean, with for example, with my the VBA course I took, um, mm -hmm. I didn't. I was kind. Of, I was probably the most uh, well educated in VBA out of the six or seven students that were there. Mm -hmm. But I, but I only understood like half of it. Um, mm -hmm. And it it wasn't until maybe six months afterwards where I where I started doing some more advanced stuff and and digging into the libraries and kind of understanding how all that work. That I I kind of remember in the back of my head. Oh. That's what he meant, and that's what he was talking about when he was going through through those lessons. So it's, I think it's definitely a give and take on that. And you're right; it's you're not gonna if you want to learn VBA, you're not gonna just sit down and and read a computer programming book and and absolutely love it and understand it. It's gonna take time. Jordan does. That's how Jordan did it. <laughs> that's uh, sitting under a tree like Johnny Appleseed. That's Jordan with a VBA book. <laughs> it's true, oh, man. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's probably it's true, yeah. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> so, uh, so congratulations. That was you only got four points on the initial initial answer, but the the follow up question got the two over. So, congratulations on that. All right. And
And next up, the Excel wow. topic of the week. Over to you, Sylvia. All right. So, um, Chris, you are the Excel guy in your office. So we want to talk about Excel in the workplace because it's often not, you know, exactly embraced by IT. And what I mean by that is the, the kind of higher end stuff that you're doing, the macros and so on. So uh, we want to talk to you about how Excel gurus like yourself uh, balance these these things. How do you balance the complex needs that business has with, um, you know, kind of what IT is already doing and how do you um, how do you form those strategic alliances with IT or do you not? Do you do you have those those battles that I had way too many of before I realized it was stupid. <laughs> well, um, at least for in my experience, IT doesn't really know much about Excel. They're kind of in their own world. Um, so kind of trying to bridge that gap isn't worth the time and effort. Um, I, I will say that uh, uh, when you're designing VBA stuff, especially in the in the workplace, um, I found it's very helpful to bring a lot of, as much as you can out into the spreadsheet um, mm -hmm. and away from the code behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So I'll do a lot of stuff with uh, like let's say I'm exporting uh, five different tabs from a worksheet. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll put a table in a spreadsheet and have that person name all the all the worksheet names that they want to export. And that way, going forward, if a new worksheet comes up that they need to include, they can, all they have to do is go into that table and type that new worksheet name. Um, so that's kind of been a progression for me. I used to kind of do everything behind the scenes, like list out all the worksheet names, and I think really bring that user interface out to the spreadsheet Mm -hmm. um, especially when you're dealing with people that don't know anything about computer programming or VBA, um, really helps them kind of get accustomed to what's going on. Right. So you reel them in slowly is what you're saying. Baby steps. <laughs> right. But I would like to say that I my progression was exactly that way, that everything was just straight code and user forms, and now everything the extent possible is on the spreadsheet. And it really, it does, I think it makes a difference. I mean, there's like some, you know, there's some exceptions to it, but the more you can do on the spreadsheet, the less IT even gets upset because you have less code, among other reasons. Until your stuff starts conflicting with things that they're already doing, and then and then you get into those, those little, those little alpha battles, right? So, um, for me personally, I don't know, Chris, how you feel about this. I found it's better to try to make friends with IT than to, because there's definitely this rift between the Excel people and the IT people, <laughs> you know, um, and it's just easier if you can work to bring those those worlds together. I don't know if you, have, like me, yeah. believe that you know this is this is. In the making because of because of Power BI and Power Pivot and stuff like that. I hope so. That's time. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my my situation is probably different from what yours is. So with my my IT department, I'm really good friends with them because they they save my butt on more than one occasion. I and might be watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they they more handle like our our cloud tools. So if we have mm -hmm. data data warehouses, so I work a lot with them to get these databases pulling in the correct information, which then split, spits that data into Excel, and then I take it from there. So the right. way kind of ours is set up is IT kind of has their programs that they're the experts at, and then us as financial analysts, we kind of uh, take the Excel and, and go do our thing. Right. I should clarify, I love IT now. I, I didn't always, but I, it's, uh, it's not that I'm at odds with them. I learned that lesson long ago. But um, no, that's, that's, that's great. That's fantastic. Right. So, um, so how do you, um, do you provide, so these people that you're sharing, as Excel people, we share our work across the organization a lot. So how do you um, have time, or do, I don't know, maybe you don't. Do you do training materials? Is it all do you put everything on your blog, and that way you can point people at the workplace um, to that? Or do, how do you how do you train people on how to use your your stuff? 
I mean, it, it kind of depends based on how accustomed they are to change in Excel. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely having people go to those classes that I was putting on um, and being able to walk them through um, and get them some hands-on experience just with certain situations helped. Mm -hmm. um, and also just kind of walking through VBA. I mean, VBA code is very intuitive. So you can, once you kind of get the hang of it, you can read it like you're reading sentences. And it, it kind of makes sense once you understand the different levels. Mm -hmm. um, so, so getting people accustomed to that really helps. I'm a big fan and advocate of uh, putting instructions right into the spreadsheet. So I even have a macro, a personal macro, that sets up like a little text box all formatted mm -hmm. nicely with instructions as the header and some bullet points. And I'll just click that, throw that on a spreadsheet, and start typing away. And screenshots help, too. Right. But I mean, when I'm, when I'm doing these advanced things, I, I try to make it um, as user-friendly as possible. And I try to just, just have buttons where you click. So right. I, can, I can go to someone and say, all, all you got to do is click this button, and it works. And right. if if you're if you have uh, a good enough level of understanding of VBA, you can code in a way where it's dynamic, and you can give someone a spreadsheet and just tell them to click a button, and it automatically does that manual work for them. So that's kind of that's kind of how I address it based on who I'm trying to train. Right. So um, in terms of uh, training people. You know, because you're writing code, and let's say you have to pass that code along to them. You know, what are things within the code that you could do to to help them out, or ways that, if let's say you need to look at it later on, um, that you can remember what you did. Well, um, one of, one of the main things I get the most feedback, um, positive feedback from with my website is I kind of put comments on after like every line of code. So I, I walk you through what every line's doing. And that really kind of puts that light bulb in people's heads. And they're like, oh, I didn't really understand it before. But now that you've kind of walked me through with all the comments, everything makes sense. I know exactly what it's doing. Whereas if you might see some code on a forum, most people just kind of are trying to get you quick answers. So they just kind of spit that code out and, and put it up to the forum. And you might people coming back later might not understand all that's going on. So it's nice to have those comments in there and try to comment as much as you can. And also, I mean, it helps me when I'm doing something that's maybe a one-off that I've never done before, and then six months later I'm coming back and I can look at that comment and be like, oh, that's what that did. So I, I remember I, I definitely wasn't commenting enough when I first started. And when I was coming back, I just found I was having to relearn all this stuff and figure out what what this object was and what, what this action did. So comments are a, a lifesaver. Tell you what, I, and I, I, probably music to Jordan's ears on that, because he's all about, you know, program for future self. <laughs> kind of? Not so much, Jordan? What are you, what mean, are you thinking on that? All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piss Jump off. Jump in. I'm going to controversial up in here, okay? I think that we comment too much. I just think that we... I mean, I'm not saying that you shouldn't comment. And um, definitely the level of comments that uh, Chris has on um, his blog is, is, is certainly appropriate. But, man, I see people... They have this, like, old style of commenting where they just have this giant block and it says who the author is and the date... Um, if they mm -hmm. created it and what it's supposed to do and like just like crazy amounts of information that nobody's going to read. I mean, I suppose perhaps um, it's for yourself later. I don't know. But I, I almost sometimes feel like we overemphasize commenting rather than uh, coding in a way that's just more easy to read. You know, there's still people who are coding without indents. I mean, that I don't, I don't want to even bring those people up. But they don't use indents. <laughs> <laughs> they don't use white space. They, you know, they're just they're just tempting me to to say. <laughs> something. I mean, that's and and that's such an easy thing versus people I've and I've seen this people struggle over comments and I'm not saying you know I mean commenting it's not that big of a deal just say what it does but um, you know they're like oh well I really need to explain so someone can follow along well that's only part of the story so is formatting your code and just not writing 
ridiculously long lines and long complex <laughs> codes. Yeah, code, and that, you know? I mean that's a great point. And if you look at my comments on the site, it's very very simplistic. Um, I'm not doing complete sentences and paragraphs like you were describing. It get to the point, say what the line does, and move on. Um, I think it's all about your audience. Some people want to have it all. They want you to write your story from the day you were born, you know, or maybe go back to the big bang. I mean, it just, and then there's other clients who are just like, ah, you know, just get it done. I don't care. Show me the button I have to click. So maybe depend, you know, I guess it depends on in, in, in a corporate environment or like where you are, Chris, you know, you kind of, you're working with the same people and stuff. And so you kind of know what they, they want, but, um, as an Excel consultant, I can say that I've I've done very little commenting, and I've done you know I've written novels. I have some clients that like details, so I think it depends. Well, I'll say this. Um, so, because I back when I used to take over people's code, you know, um, well, you know, I guess I will do it my job. Um, there's this like effect that's like um, where people write long, they start with like this long procedure and it just goes on and on forever and instead of breaking that up into sub-procedures yeah. saying, hey, let's do this, they just at, like comment these giant sections so they're, they, you know, there's like a big comment block this does this here, this does this here rather than separating it out um, because I think that would make a lot more sense if you separated it out and just had one big procedure, do this now, sure. do this now, do this now Ooh, I'm getting motivated about this. This is, <laughs> but yes, so, so, that's something that gets me is these long. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm going on forever, but I do hate procedures that go on forever as well. To be fair. <laughs> right. Okay. All right, so Jordan, I, I don't want you to get too worked up. So I want you to, I want you to channel that energy for the next segment of the show. And over to Jordan Goldmeyer. Excel oh, tips. Oh wow, that was great. That was great. Okay, let me share my screen. Let me let me uh, share it real quick. Um, so I'm only using one screen this time. I'm gonna hit on Protect Sheet here. Uh, so you know, a lot of us uh, have to protect our sheets. I mean, this really is not a. Uh, it's a dangerous world, and we need protection. So if you hit, <laughs> I'm, I have a sample. Um, button here that says press me. I click it and you see that it's updating what's going on in cell D2. One of the most common complaints I hear from folks is, well, hey, I, I have a macro, but I need to protect my sheet. And then um, when I protect the sheet, uh, usually in the code, but sometimes up here, we're going to use it for the code. A lot of folks will try to uh, protect their worksheet and they'll find that, well, if to use a macro, um, it, it requires that you unprotect the worksheet. Um, and that's actually the conventional wisdom um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to protect the worksheet. I have this uh, allow macros here, but we're actually not going to allow them. You'll see why in a second. I have me.protect. I'm within the sheet object. I'm going to say protect this sheet. I'm going to say user interface only equals false. Now, most of the times you don't really see this user face um, uh, only. It's defaulted to false, but it's actually important because it's going to be the property that we're going to change that's going to allow us to use macros even when the sheet is protected. But I'm going to keep it off for here and just be explicit just for the purpose of demonstration so I, can, so I can show you. So I hit press me. You see I get this 400 error. That's because it's not allowing me to change this anymore because we protected the worksheet. So a lot of people don't really know that when you protect the worksheet within the code, there is this um, part of uh, the protection, and I'm just going to hit space here just so it shows up. You see this is this user interface only. Now if I set this to true, this actually solves the problem. This is one of the coolest things that I learned um, because for so many years I didn't know that you could do this. So I'm going to run this again. We're still protecting the worksheet, but now when I hit press me, you can see that it actually works. So this is very cool. You still can protect the sheet and run your macros. It's like having your cake and eating it too. So, so you just never have back. to re-protect. So you just you just say user interface only, and then you don't have to do reprotect at the end of the code. That's right. That's right. That is right. You don't have to protect and unprotect, which is by far one of the most annoying things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jordan. Appreciate that. So now on to the new section of the show.
there's a lot going on in the news. So let's walk you through it. So first up, over here, be sure that you remember our old friend, our Mr. Excel TV alumnus, Oz Du Soleil, is working on illustrations for his new book. Come over here and check out his Indiegogo campaign and watch him draw a house, some doors, and watch him draw some stuff and then tell you, hey, you don't want a book that looks like this. So help Oz, our buddy, out over here with his Indiegogo campaign. It looks like there's about another 13 days or so left. He's 65% funded so far, so come over here and check it out and support the Excel community. Next up, this was just released, I think today or possibly yesterday, the Excel Global Training Camp. So this is from the guys over at Model Off. It's like they partnered up. As best I could tell, it's like they partnered up with Excel, with Microsoft Excel, to offer training through three different streams: business and financial analysis, financial modeling, corporate finance, and M&A, and advanced Excel and business intelligence. And this is all in London, December 3rd and 4th. It looks like it's pretty closely to coincide with the Model Off finals that are happening at that time. Lastly, one more thing. If you're wondering who this cool guy, Chris Macro, is, Mr. Chris Newman, come over here and check out his blog over here at the Spreadsheet Guru. Very colorful, a lot of stuff going on, particularly with, let's see, come over here, he's got the Code Vault, and in the Code Vault, he's got Excel VBA Vault, a PowerPoint, so pretty much almost anything that you'd want to kind of check out. And I'd recommend all of you to come over here and check that out. Great website. <laughs> Go team. Huh? He says humbly. We agree. <laughs> All right. Excellent. So lastly, where can you find us? Well, gosh, gosh. we're all over the place. But in addition to that, we're on LinkedIn and you know, we're over here on Excel.tv, so I'd recommend that you go check us out. And, and Chris, would you mind telling us our audience where they can find you? Oh, I'm just about everywhere. Uh, I'm at Chris Macro on Twitter. Uh, I'm on Google Plus, uh, Facebook. I've got a newsletter with a lot of really cool Excel tips that you'll get uh, every other week. So that would be a good place to sign up and just kind of get those sent straight to your inbox. Um, and I also started an Instagram account a couple weeks ago, so I've been playing around with that. So. So how does an Excel guy use an Instagram account? Because we tried that, and you know we have a picture of of, uh, of me and a picture of Jordan at Model Off last year, and Jordan's got his cool green glasses on, and uh, that's about it. That's our Instagram. That's Excel TV Instagram account. So, so what are you doing with it? Give us some tips here. What are you doing, bud? I'm kind of taking a, a I guess Excel theater approach. So I'm I'm going on Twitter and trying to find people venting about Excel and and kind of doing quotes that way. And I'll probably end up doing maybe some business motivational quotes. Quotes is big on Instagram, so um, just playing around with that, see if that takes off. Nice. So you, uh, might, so you might do uh, do some quotes from your your show. Awesome, Jordan. Always post that there. Use Option explicit. <laughs> right. We, we didn't get Bill to Jones. check in with you. Uh, Bill Jones very, said that. Uh. In, in, in 15 seconds or less, where do you stand in the on the great option explicit debate? Which side of the? I don't know if I want to. I don't know if I want to say. It's towards the end of the show, so it's all good. <laughs> Nobody's watching. I, I do. I do not use it. I'm in the the bill. <gasps> bill camp. Ha 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 ha! Neither. <laughs> I don't care. Jordan cares. I don't. I just want the quote <laughs> to say that. I just want the quote to say that Bill Jelen said it. I don't. You know, use it or not. Just Instagram quote it. So 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 <laughs> yeah. So so coding coding your VBA is good as long as it's the appropriate amount. The appropriate amount includes option explicit. That that pretty much the way it goes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, well, Chris, th thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, you know, I, I we sat around with gosh, we were at the well, 
Jordan was at the MVP Summit last year. I was just kind of tagging along. And I got to hang around with some really cool people. Uh, we're having some some beverages at one time with John Akinfora of, uh, of Excel Campus and Minda Tracy. And we're talking about, okay, well, you know, how do you create a list and all that sort of stuff? And your name came up. And your name came up as, you know, as somebody who was doing it right. So uh, we pass that along to you. You know, uh, this was, gosh, almost a year ago at the time. So, you know, people have, have noticed what you're doing, and you're doing a lot of good out there. And the fact that you already have 4,000-plus people on your email list says that you obviously are sharing a lot of good information out there. So thank you for that, and thank you for being part of the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, so so now my claim to fame is I got to hang out with Chris Macro on a, on a video conference, and so it's it's not as good as I used. To, I had dinner with him, and and like Jordan Goldmeyer. I'm from Ohio. So that's right there. We're moving down there. So everybody, this one's in the books. We're going to see you again in two weeks, and we'll tip you a little bit here, um, Mr. Can I go ahead and tell him, Jordan? Is he'll be here Tom, next week. Tom Curtis. Tom Ertis. So Mr. Tom Ertis of Atlas Programming is going to be here in two weeks. So gosh, that's going to be a good one. You know, he has a book that he put out just two weeks ago, or excuse me, just a few months ago. And you know, he's working on a training program as well. So there's some really cool stuff going on that uh, I encourage you to be here in two weeks. But hey, until then, this is Rick Rantham, along with Jordan Goldmeyer and Sylvia Juhaj, reminding you to keep on excelling. We'll see you next time.